what should I play in the opening? Or what type of opening? Or what opening should I play? And the question is obviously relates to both white as well as black. And there's no definitive answer. It really, really is a matter of uh, taste and style. But uh, uh, if you're familiar with any of my lectures, you've, you, you've heard me talk about the battlefield, right? The chessboard and what are the long diagonals. And it's really interesting, regardless of what opening you play and defense you play, it's like these, op these long diagonals are like magnets for the bishop. Just, you know, you play a game and then suddenly you realize your bishop's on the, open di on the long diagonal. And uh, so with that in mind, and the idea that bishops do belong on the long diagonals because they're the most effective diagonals, why doesn't everybody just fianchetto their bishops from the get-go? Just uh, fianchetto your bishops and you'll be happy. So when I was a kid, one of my favorite defenses was what we called the kingside fianchetto, what we called in Seattle, by the way, the rat. And we would just fianchetto our king's bishop. And my idea is black, and I'll be speaking to this defense as from the perspective of the black player. So I'll just actually uh, flip the, the, the board for a second. Control, uh, control flip. There we go. So normally speaking, the white pieces are always at the bottom and the black pieces are always at the top. I'll just flip it because I'm talking about the opening, or in this case, the defense from black's point of view. So what my idea is, I'd put my bishop here where it would be on the long diagonal. Then I'd put my knight on f6 and I'd castle and I'd have built a fortress, right? That was what I was trying to do. And what is it that we're trying to do in the opening as black? What are we trying to do with the defense against, for example, e4? Well, what we're trying to do is fight for the center. That's what we want to do. We want to fight for our fair share of the center. And to be very specific, when I talk about the center, I'm talking about these 16 squares right here in the center of the board. We're trying to control the center. That's our first basic strategy of the defense. We're trying to develop our pieces or get good squares for our pieces. So we want central control and development. And thirdly, and most importantly, we want a safe king. We're very, very modest in our goals uh, in what we're trying to do. So what I strongly recommend is to have you in your repertoire what we would call the accelerated dragon. I just even like the name of the defense, the accelerated dragon. You know, it is not just good enough that you should play the dragon variation of the Sicilian, but you should play the accelerated dragon of the Sicilian. So what's the idea of the accelerated dragon of the Sicilian? Well, first of all, uh, my approach to when my opponent plays e4, my approach as from the perspective of the defender is twofold. The first type of defense is where I attack the pawn on e4. And I can do that by playing d5, which is called the Scandinavian. I can play the Alekhines. I can play the Karo Khan. Any, or I can play a French defense. Any defense with the idea of immediately attacking the e4 pawn is one type of defense. A second type of defense is to say to white, OK, congratulations. You got your pawn on e4. I'm going to leave you alone. You leave me alone, I'll leave you alone. And the Sicilian is the secondary type of defense, where basically um, Black is saying to white, congratulations, you keep your pawn in the center of the board, which is a good thing for white. This pawn on e4, after all, does control the squares f5 and d5. And you leave me alone, and I'm going to play c5, and this pawn controls two of your squares. So tit for tat. You've got your thing going, I've got my thing going. So this is 
the Sicilian defense, C5. Now, white has a, a wide range of possibilities, but as we're going to see, what I'm really trying to do is fianchetto my king's bishop and create a fortress on the king side. So I'll have a safe king. So what I want is my fair share of the center. I want good development for my pieces. And I want a safe king. So that's all I'm trying to do as black when I play the accelerated Sicilian. OK, so white plays knight f3. By far, this is the most popular move, by far. Uh, other, there, while there is a large number of moves that white can choose from, white can choose, for example, to go into what is called the closed Sicilian, or he can play the C3 uh, Sicilian and play for uh, D4, D2, D4, and get a big center. By far, the most popular move is knight f3. And I will go back in a moment to look at alternative moves on move two for white and why they shouldn't bother you, okay? That you can accept them. But by far, this is considered the most aggressive move by today's modern theoreticians. Knight f3. I play the move knight c6. Okay. You develop your knight, I develop my knight. And again, white has a vi uh, not such a wide variety of choices. He can, again, go for the move c3. He can even play for g3. Um, but again, the most popular move by far for white is d4. And this initiates what is called the open Sicilian. Once these pawns get traded, the position becomes a little bit more open. There's a pair of pawns that go off the board, so that's why it's called the open Sicilian. We take the pawn. Knight takes d4. And again, the, the variation we want to concentrate on this evening is a fianchettoing our king's bishop. And we do it exactly in this move order. We first play our knight to c6, and then we play g7, g6. Now, again, from our point of view, we don't really care too much what our opponent does, but from what, what we're trying to do is very simple. We're trying to fianchetto our bishop to g7, which we are going to do, bring our knight to f6, castle, and actually, we're going to be very pleased with ourselves. Why? Because we notice that we have two pawns in the center of the board, and our opponent only has one. We've traded, essentially, this pawn on c7 for what was this pawn on d2. So at the end of the day, we're actually going to have more central control than our opponent, thanks to the fact that we have an extra pawn in the center. It's that simple. Now, white has two main lines here. There's not really that much else to choose from. He can play the move c2, c4, which sets up what is called the Moroxi bind position. Ooh, I don't even like the sound of that. I'm being bound. Uh, or he could play what we call the accelerated dragon with knight c3. We're going to concentrate on this move for a moment. And by the way, do feel free to ask questions, raise your hand, let me know if you have a question. But this move, knight c3, is very popular. OK, so knight c3 developing a piece, and bishop g7 in turn developing our piece. Notice that with this move, bishop g7, by the way, we set up a very concrete threat. If you don't answer this threat, I'm just going to play knight takes knight. I'm a piece up. <laughs> Boy, that was the most successful opening of all time. OK, one of the things that we really, really want white to do is we really want white to capture our knight. Because if he were to capture our knight, this really helps us tremendously in our battle for the center. Notice that our we've recaptured uh, using the 
the, the strategical capture towards the center. Our pawn, now on c6, our newly minted pawn on c6, controls the square d5, which is very good at hampering this knight's movement. And also notice that the b file has been opened to black's advantage. So black's natural play in the future will involve moves like rook b8 and perhaps even queen a5, putting pressure on this knight on c3, again, thanks to our uh, fianchetto bishop. So it would be a strategic mistake for white to trade knights. Okay. The most natural move for white is bishop e3, obviously. Uh, where is it? Uh, new main variation? Yeah, there we go. Okay, defending his knight. And, of course, uh, developing his piece. Our opponent's pretty clever. He understands what he's doing. Um, besides capturing our knight on c6, our opponent might even consider retreat, retreating his knight to b3 or retreating his knight to e2. Personally, it's never bothered me. Wherever our opponent wants to retreat, let him retreat. Like, hey, good, we got him to retreat. Okay, first of all, any retreat would mean that the knight would be moving again and white would be falling behind in development. So bishop e3 is absolutely white's best move. Okay, and here black has kind of come to a crossroads. In a normal dragon Sicilian, the idea for black is to play the move d7, d6. And when we play the move d7, d6, this is what gives this variation its name, the dragon. So if we take all the pieces off the board and we just look at this structure for just a second, we imagine that this is a dragon. This is kind of like the head of the dragon, the body of the dragon, the wing of the dragon. And that's where the name of the dragon Sicilian gets its name from. So with the move d7, d6, we properly transpose into a dragon Sicilian. What our move order is intended to achieve is that we don't want to push our pawn to d6 too early. We want to leave that option for ourselves of maybe, maybe, playing the move d7, d5 in one go. If we can do that, not only will we accelerate beyond being simply equal, we could have an advantage. But of course, as we s realize right now, the idea of playing d7, d5 in this pos position makes no sense. Pawn on e4 and the knight on c3 both uh, uh, cover, protect, attack, uh, the square d5. Okay, so after bishop e3, we play the move knight f6. This is our main, uh, just a second, or why does it keep asking me what I'm doing? <laughs> okay, the main, main line. Okay, so what we're trying to do now is, of course, We've prepared our fortress. We're going to hide our king. We're going to be perfectly safe over here on the king side, we hope. We'll find out in a moment. But we'll, uh, we'll have uh, fortified our king position. And notice that now with the knight on f6, I want to play d7, d5 in one go because my knight and my queen will protect the, will support the advance of our pawn to d5. Now, there's a lot of reasons, subtle reasons, for this tricky move order by black. You're trying to avoid something that I won't go into great detail about, is you're trying to avoid the dangers of a normal dragon Sicilian. And you're trying to push your opponent into a narrow path. You, you're unlike the modern defense or the rat that I was, trying, that I was playing as a kid, 
what you're trying to do is narrow White's choices dramatically. Okay, so let's kind of sum up what's happened. For the moment, we've got decent development, right? For the moment, you know, we've got our fair share of the center, and we're about to have a safe king. So if I could ask the class their opinion, what, what do you think white should do in this specific position? Okay, just throw out some suggestions for what would be good moves for white. Sir? Queen d2. Queen d2, okay. So with the move queen d2, which uh, is a very normal looking move. I mean, you develop a piece, nothing wrong with that. Um, it, it seems from our point of view that also with the move queen d2, you've connected your king and rook, giving you the option of perhaps castling queenside and whatever. And a moment ago, when I was talking about the, uh, the variation that Kasparov favored against the rat, maybe, just maybe, you have it in mind that you want to disturb my king side with the move bishop h6. However, the move queen d2 actually has a drawback. After the move queen d2, notice that a moment ago when your queen was on d1, it protected the square g4 and didn't make this jump knight g4. I didn't have this option. Now that you've put your queen on d2, I have the option of playing knight g4 with a very, very clear intention of eliminating your bishop. If I can eliminate this bishop for this knight, it means I forever take away your possibility of playing bishop h6 and trading off what I think is a very powerful bishop that uh, is on the long diagonal. And it turns out this very natural move, queen d2, gets white actually into a spot of trouble after the move knight g4. So another suggestion for white. What else could white do that would make you feel unhappy? You want me to guess? <laughs> OK. Well, I have mentioned that in the background, there is a battle that is going on for control of the d5 square. Black wants to play d5. So in this position, by far the most popular move, according to the Ripka book, is the move uh, bishop uh, c4. Okay. So the idea behind bishop c4 is not only is white developing a piece, good for him, but he's also controlling the square d5, which was your secret ambition. Because you have not advanced your pawn earlier, like in a normal dragon, your secret ambition had been to play the move d5. So this wise guy on the other side of the board has already preempted your plan before you could even put it into effect. Pretty clever, huh? Let's look at another uh, move that White could make. Now, when I started the lecture, I explained that this capture on c6 is something that black welcomes. If you trade that knight on c6, this, this trade uh, works out into black's favor. However, after this trade in this specific position, uh, there is a, white does have a motivating reason for making that trade in this exact position because now he can advance his pawn, and the rat fink, the dirty rat fink, he, he disrupts our natural development. We were so happy. A moment ago, we were about to put our king over here uh, behind our fortress walls and claim that we were nice and safe. And look at this. Our opponent has already uh, provoked us and attacked our knight. OK, our knight has two squares that it could move. Well, more squares, but the best squares 
to be considered our knight d5, as well as uh, a retreat knight g8. A lot of grandmasters have played the move knight d5, knight takes d5, pawn takes, queen takes d5, purposefully sacrificing a pawn for black. Their idea was that with the move rook b8, we're getting counterplay against the pawn on b2, as well as ideas like queen c7 attacking the pawn on e5, as well as ideas of just simply castling and playing d6, blasting open this long diagonal. A lot of games have been played in Grandmaster practice, and the overall view is that, unfortunately, this gambit is not good for black. And I agree with that. Uh, white has done nothing wrong, uh, and so uh, we can't punish white for his place thus far. And I like the move knight g8. That's my recommended move. Okay. So even though it's a temporary setback, right? We've been forced to retreat. Uh, don't be too upset. Don't be too upset. We are threatening to capture the pawn on e5. And if we do, we win a pawn. We're happy. So white usually protects his pawn. Clever boy f4, protecting his pawn on e5. And now we see that our knight has a problem. We've got to get the knight into the game. So it's very natural for us to play this move, knight h6. But here's the great benefit of the knight being on h6, is it's about to come to the f5 square, where we attack the bishop, and it will be nicely in the center. So let's just continue this line for a moment. And the line, as I remember it, goes like queen f3, castles. And I believe white castles here, if I'm not mistaken. And now we play the move f7, f6. So what the idea of white, of black's play, is to blast open this long diagonal to open up his bishop and put his knight on f5. Well, again, the grandmaster practice has actually confirmed that black's position is pretty darn good, that this is a good position. And the results are actually that black scores better than white does. In other words, uh, grandmaster's play has proven that black's position is not only resilient, it's actually good. He scores well. So we're going to go back to our main line position, and we're going to go to the move bishop c4 as our um, main move. I think that's the one at the top. Yeah. OK, before I continue, are there any other moves that you would consider for white? We've looked at queen d2. We've looked at knight takes c6. And we're about to look at the main, main variation Bishop c4. Any other moves? All of these moves look pretty purposeful for both sides. OK. Um, let's see, is that a line? No, we're not going to worry about that yet. Uh, we'll look at the move f2, f3 uh, in, a, in a moment. We can come back to that move in a moment. Instead, we're going to look at bishop c4. Oops, that's not right. Bishop c4 is our main move. And after the move, bishop c4, we castle. OK. And we leave it up to white to decide what he's going to do. In this specific position, the grandmasters considered the move f2, f3 unnecessary. And they don't like spending the whole tempo for f3. They don't like spending playing the move queen d2, because of, as we've pointed out, knight g4 is a good answer to queen d2. Most grandmasters have played the move bishop b3. So what's the idea behind bishop b3? The bishop is a little bit of a, it's, it's not protected. 
out there. It's a little bit of a tactical target. And so the bishop simply steps back into safety. Now, this is again a major crossroads for black. If we play the move d7, d6 here, we're right back in a normal Sicilian dragon. And all of our beautiful, subtle play to get the accelerated dragon has been lost. We gain nothing through this move order by playing d6 in this position. So we have to come up with a more insightful move. And that move, surprisingly enough, is the move a7, a5. OK, so <clears throat> what do you think the purpose of the move a5 is? Don't all guess at once. Harass the bishop. Precisely, to harass the bishop. Basically, from Black's perspective, he would love to capture this pawn. Just, that would just be outstanding. We'd win a pawn, our favorite living condition. But the problem with capturing the pawn, of course, is it's protected by the knight. It would cost as a knight, and that's not good. Don't, don't, don't lose your pieces. Don't, lo don't be like me. Don't lose your pieces. So with this move a5, our intention is to play a4, harassing the bishop. And if we could force the bishop to capture the pawn on a4, or the knight to capture the pawn on a4, we want to follow up with knight takes e4. OK. So after a5, white has a problem. What should white do? What do you think? What's a good move for white? Yes, young man. Push your pawn up to a4. A very, very uh, wise idea. Push your pawn up to a4. OK, so we, uh, we have to go back for just a moment to this position. And you've heard me, well, being a little bit critical about the move d7, d6, because this transposes into what we call the mainline variation of um, the Sicilian dragon. Well, in a mainline variation of a Sicilian dragon, after, for example, the move f3, <coughs> bishop d7, queen d2, we're about to get one of the wild, wild chess games going. What white is about to do is to castle with his king to the queen side. We've already made a commitment. We made, we castled a long time ago, so we said to White, we telegraphed to White, this is our address for our king. Okay. Our opponent knows where our king is already placed, so he knows where to focus. Now, when White castles queenside, it's one of those games, one of those sharp, sharp positions where when we're castled on opposite flanks, it's our duty to attack our opponent's king with a flank attack. And it's our opponent's duty to attack our king with a flank attack. Now, if I can include the move a5 as well as a4, this is good for me, the black player, because I've gotten white to weaken his king's position. So the inclusion of the move a5 and a4 is actually quite, well, somewhat favorable for black. So although I do like the move a4, um, in this specific position is actually kind of good for black. So another suggestion for white. What else could white do? Is he busted? Is it hopeless? <laughs> Is it over? Yes, young man, what do you think white should do? Yes, but then if you play the move bishop c4, you're kind of like wasting some time. You've moved your bishop here once. 
you drop back with the bishop twice, and now you'll be moving the bishop again, third time. However, still the, the, the suggestion of bishop c4 deserves consideration for a very specific reason. Now again, you've heard me say, <coughs> keep this tempo move in reserve. Don't just play d7, d6, but give yourself the opportunity of playing d7, d5 in one go. And this is an example of the type of situation where that becomes very useful. For example, after bishop c4, you give me the option of capturing the pawn on e4. So what's the idea behind that? Haven't we mentioned a moment ago that if we take this pawn on e4, it just costs us a knight, we blundered a knight. Ah, not so fast, not so fast. Now, thanks to the fact that your bishop on, is on c4 and your knight is on e4, you give me the opportunity to win my piece back with the move d7, d5. Okay, I haven't necessarily won any material, but I'm very pleased that my king is safe for the moment. My bishop is really good. It's really good on this diagonal. And I'm either going to take this bishop or I'm going to take this knight. Now, you can do something about that. You can move one piece or the other. Um, you could, for example, in this position, take my knight and drop back with your bishop. But notice in the resulting type of position what has happened. My bishop on g7 is on this nice open diagonal. My bishop has come to life, and I can snap off this pawn on b2, and that would leave me, black, in a very good position. So we need to find another move beside a4, as well as besides bishop c4. What else could white play? F3. Very reasonable move. F2, F3. OK. So now, let me see if I've got this position right. So now after F2, F3, if I play the move d7, d6, we're back into a dragon position. And I've committed my pawn to a5, and well, maybe that's not so good for me. Maybe that's actually good for you. So how about if I play the move d5? Yeah, very good, very good. Now things are beginning to heat up, and I'm about to blow open the center. Of course, if you simply allow me to capture the pawn on e4, I'll be very happy with the position. So with the move d7, d5, I'm taking a risk. Your bishop on b3, your knight on c3, your pawn on e4 was like a warning sign. He's saying, you can't play d5. I'll capture that pawn on d5. And yet I played it anyway. OK, so this is I'm throwing down the gauntlet. This is a challenge. How should white capture the pawn on d5? What do you guys think? What's a good move for white here? Sorry. Bishop takes d5. That's a good move. Uh, in fact, there's three possibilities, of course. There's knight takes d5. There's bishop takes d5. And there's pawn takes d5. Let's look at each one in turn, shall we? OK, so what would we do if our opponent played knight takes d5? Well, remember that we played the move a5 with a specific idea, right? We wanted to harass white's bishop. And that's precisely what we're going to do. We're going to harass white's bishop. We're going to go a5, a4. Now, don't fall for this mistake if you're white. Don't capture my knight on f6. Bishop takes f6. Again and again, I'll repeat myself very often, 
our bishop on this long diagonal suddenly is creating some kind of very nasty threats and I'm threatening to, to capture this knight. Now if you try to protect the knight on d4 with the move bishop here, can black win a piece? Can black win a piece? Uh, what do you think, guys? Guys and gals. Yes. What would you do, young man? From yes, I can move my pawn from e7 to e6. That is correct. But after I move my pawn to if I move my pawn to e6 immediately, maybe my knight will get captured. So what I can do is I can trade pieces first. I can, in this position, I can trade pieces. Queen takes d4. And notice that the queens are opposing one another. Or to put it more specifically, this bishop on d5 is pinned. It can't move because its, it, its queen would be left hanging. So I could play the move e7 in e6, and I would win a piece. Yay. Not only did I make it out of the opening uh, intact, but I actually win material. So this would not be a good line of play for, for white. He would have to play bishop c4 here, I believe. OK. New, new main line. Okay. So, the f one of the f first things we should notice is that besides the fact we're a pawn down, which makes us very, very upset, and we've got to do something about that right away, is for the moment, White's king is still in the center. We're very pleased with ourselves. Just a second. Let me give myself a pat on the back. <laughs> uh, my king is nice and safe. This is a very good thing. It makes our, our daddies happy, our mommies happy whenever we have a safe king. Uh, and it sets up the following. We're going to capture this knight on d5, which once again opens up our bishop. And we're hoping, we're hoping that our opponents will fall for it and make a major mistake and capture with the bishop. Because this sets us right back up into that situation we had a moment ago where we could win a piece thanks to the pin on the d-file. Correct? Exactly. So he, white, would have to recapture with the pawn. OK. Now, what can we do if we're black? Clearly, our knight on c6 is under dire threat. We've got to do something about that. Jeez. And now, knight takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, queen takes. Doesn't give us that desirable uh, si uh, situation of a pin in our favor. Do we have another move? Or do we have other moves? Young man. Knight e5 is a most excellent move. Knight e5 is a most excellent move. The pawn on d5 is only defended by the bishop. If we could get the bishop to move away, let's say to retreat, then we could win our pawn back and we are in a great shape, right? OK. And is there another move besides knight e5? On a similar note, we could also play knight to a5. The same idea, right? The knight is better when it's centralized. That's correct. However, I always kind of think of a chess game as like a market. You go to market and you're always bartering with someone. How much for the apple? How much for the pepper? How much for the cherries? And you're always weighing the money you have in your pocket versus what you can buy. When 
you play the move knight e5, which is very good. Knights need to be centralized. What's the downside of putting our knight on e5? It blocks the bishop. It blocks the bishop. So even while we're patting ourselves on our back, because we understand that the knight is better when it's centralized, we also have blocked our bishop. So we have to judge whether the knight could be better on a5 or e5. So let's bring up our audience and, and the variations we've been discussing. So in fact, what I'd like to point out in this specific position is black has three very good moves with his knight. What the young man and I are discussing is that in either the cases of knight a5 or knight e5, he mentions that white could play the move b3, which protects the bishop. And in cases of knight takes, the pawn would recapture. And guess what? White would be a pawn ahead. OK? Now, that's not the end of the story. In fact, the story could go on for a long, long time. White is a pawn up. Applause, applause. White's a pawn up. But if you notice that the pawns are doubled, that is to say, this pawn on c2 and this pawn on c4 occupy the same file, and hence we use the expression, the pawns are doubled. And it's not going to be very easy for white to defend this pawn. In fact, we can imagine that when the bishop goes here, and the rook goes here, and the queen goes here, we could capture this pawn right away. So let's imagine that in this position, white plays the move queen c7, attacking this pawn on c4. If I can take this pawn on c4, I'd restore the material balance, and the pawn on d5 would also be weak. Let's continue the line. White could defend the pawn with maybe queen e2 or either queen d3. We have to choose one. Let's choose d3. Yeah. And let's imagine that we play the move bishop d7. Now it starts to dawn on us that, well, this move rook c8 is coming with a big power. But we can go back. Could, in this position, could black play a different move? Could black play a different move? than queen c7, I mean. Hmm. Tough, huh? What do you think, Ben? <laughs> no, I meant this. <laughs> I know, you're texting. <laughs> Facebook. I'm using a computer. Oh, that's, a, now that's very clever. OK. Well, can I check my opponent? Because I al always check, it may be mate, right? Have you ever heard that expression? Always check, it may be mate? So one of the first moves I would definitely investigate is check. And if checks aren't available, the next move I always investigate is a capture. Can I capture something, right? And if that's not available, then I try to look for a move. <laughs> but I always look at checks first, and then I always look for captures. So in this position, this move queen c7, I would be very attracted to, but I'd also be very attracted to a check. Isn't this disruptive to our opponent? After all, it's not very pleasant to uh, suddenly be faced with a check. What could white do? Yes, young man. Bishop back to d2. Bishop back to d2. Fair enough. OK, let's stop and think about this position for a second. Now, so far, who's been, who's been, who's done what to whom? I mean, what I mean to say is, hasn't black kind of had an initiative? He's the one that's been pushing the action, so to speak. His king is perfectly safe. 
Notice how this bishop, once again, is on this beautiful diagonal. And what, with this move, bishop d2, you're blocking the check to your king. And, very nicely from white's point of view, you're attacking the queen. Well, where can the queen move now? Where can white? Black? C5. Fabulous. Suddenly, the position is clarifying itself, and we discover much to our horror or surprise, that white is in serious trouble. We, we use the expression in chess, deep doo-doo. <laughs> you guys ever heard what that means? Deep doo-doo? Like really, really deep. Uh, the bishop attacks the knight, the queen attacks the knight. Once this pawn on d5 falls, uh, c4 falls, pardon me, this pawn on d5 is weak. So black has already gotten an advantage in this position. Now we're going to go back, and we're going to play, oops, no. We're going to play the other move for a moment, e takes d5. And I said black had three good moves with his knight. I said knight e5 is an excellent move. It centralizes our knight. Knight a5 is an excellent move. It attacks the bishop and we hope to win our pawn back on d5 and to keep our bishop open. Our third very good move, which is very, very common in the accelerated dragon, is the move knight b4. Okay. Uh, it's really your personal choice or taste, if you will, as to which move you prefer. Knight e5, knight a5, knight before. But the point of knight before is very clear. If we can win our pawn back with the move knight takes d5, we're going to have an excellent position. Simply excellent. What could white do? What can white do? Young man? Excellent. Move the knight back to e2. And the reason you did that is because you saw that your queen is now defending the pawn on d5. That was very clever. Very clever. So now it's black to move. And before you all rush out and say, I know, I know, Think of how many good moves black has in this position. I don't want to hear one good move for black. I want to hear three. Black has three good moves. Young man. Okay, so Julian, I think it was bishop f5, which is a good move, right? Because with this bishop coming to f5, we want to play knight takes check, to the king, attack the rook, the knight would attack the bishop. So bishop f5 is an excellent good move. Bishop takes b2, wins our pawn back. That's a, also a good move. And a4, a3 is also, remember that little uh, pawn that just kind of like ran up the board and seemed to do nothing? Now our rook is getting active. What a dream, what a dream come true it will be to play A takes B2. We'll be only one square away from, pr from promotion. And we'll be attacking that rook. So we're going to go back to this position. And we made a, an interesting, dis remarkable discovery that this solid, safe looking move, F2, F3, allows us tactical opportunities with the move d5. So it turns out that after the move f3, white ends up with serious issues. Serious issues. Mm -hmm.